Well, so today I've got a shortened version of um, our introduction to kingdom generosity. And the reason is that I've got locked and loaded our first week. It's in the computer ready to go. It's in my heart ready to go. And the Lord redirected today. And so today you're going to get a message that's coming from the heart of the Lord for us to prepare us for this series of kingdom generosity. And alongside it, he's showing the nature of who he is. And this is the, the phrase that I've got, that the Holy Spirit is wanting to tutor us and they want to train us and want to teach us through miracles, through healing, that our faith will increase, that he's a generous God and he actually does care about the little things in our life as well as the big things. So we are going to be tutored by the Holy Spirit through this series and it's starting with me being tutored and saying that message is coming another week. This message is coming today. And <clears throat> part of what he's wanting us to realise as we launch into this Kingdom Generosity series is that it's not only about material things. It's part of that, but it stops short if we think of generosity only as being practical, material things. His full nature is all about generosity and kindness towards you in every area of your life and also to those that are not here today, that are outside these walls. And so as I share today, I want you to understand where I'm coming from as lead pastor and also what's been my journey to get me to this point of also saying, I know he's generous. I know that we can show more of his generosity as we receive more from him and understanding who he is. So we're going to see generosity through his lens and we're going to, through this series, also recognise that generosity is simply a gift and a mindset that says when I'm generous to someone, I give resources from what I have, resources what I have to someone that's going to be for their well-being and it comes at a cost to me. Doesn't that sound like God? Doesn't that sound like healing? He's so generous with what he wants to bring that, that he's saying to us that he wants us to share our stuff, our resources, but he wants anything that we've got, anything that I have, we can give it for others' well-being. And so today we're going to look at a couple of stories about what that looks like for us. And I wonder, have you met people... <laughs> Because, you know, generosity is, is kind of a funny word. We can be generous in spirit and we can be generous in, in the way that we open our homes. But I'm sure you've met people that might have hardly anything. They might have no, no stuff or money or substance in the way that the world would say they are rich, they are wealthy. But at the same time, they are the bright spot in our worlds because... They understand and radiate welcome and they understand and radiate hospitality and joy and generosity and they're so open-handed with what they have. Do you know people like this? And yet they're not carrying a lot of material wealth. God says they are rich in his sight. And then you probably also know people who have lots of money, who have lots of material stuff, have enough money maybe and then there's this anxiety in these people that they're going to lose their stuff or that there's an anxiety about their future. They've got all this stuff, but there's an anxiety about their security and their safety. And they've got all this stuff that's imprisoned and not free because they don't understand the nature of a generous God and they don't understand what they have is to be shared with others. And so the Bible would call them poor in God's eyes. And so we're going to be looking over this series at the fact that mon having money and having the ability to be generous are two totally different things. Having money and having the ability to be generous are two totally different things. And having money and having joy is also two totally different things. You can have them both, but they don't necessarily correlate. So the first announcement that I'm going to tell you in our series on generosity, in our introduction today, is, <coughs> unfortunately, Bill Gates has not yet become a part of the vineyard. 
Bill Gates and all his funds and money and, and entrepreneurship and all the things that he brings get part of the global vineyard. And so we are talking about kingdom ventures that doesn't have an unbelievably huge pot of money or funding behind it. And so as we look at kingdom generosity and we look at initiatives and things that God's doing, we just believe that there's a vital work that God's calling us to and Bill Gates is not going to be part of it. We are. We are the ones that represent his generosity. And so we, when, we, when I'm telling the stories today and as we start this conversation, I just want you to know that it's through the generosity of the people of God that we see kingdom things happen. And Harry brought um, a difference that we were at a couple of weeks ago. If you were here, you would remember that he, he and a number of people were impacted by some things that were shared by our New Zealand friends in the vineyard that came over and did some sessions with us. And God ministered powerfully. And so the reason we've got this conversation going is because there's something God's doing amongst us. And he's wanting, as Harry said, to teach us how to open the windows of heaven. And today you saw it with healing. He said, reach into that spare parts room and grab something. And we're going to be looking at the at kingdom generosity with the fact that we get to partner with opening the windows of heaven over your life, over our life, and over the life of people around us. So that's where we're starting. And today I want to read from Matthew 13. Because Jesus gives us a really good illustration that we're going to kick off with just as we reflect on what does it mean to find what is valuable to Jesus. And he starts in verse 44 saying, Jesus' words are, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. And again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. And when, ev when he had discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. So the context is a good story about buried treasure. Don't we love it? Buried treasure stories are, are things that we love to, to know, even in our fairy tales and in our context. But in this context, the people hearing Jesus' words about finding something in a field, about buried treasure, they were actually in widespread poverty. Mostly peasants that would have been hearing these words. And they were hearing the, the stories of buried treasure and they knew about it because it was popular in that time. In that time, there were stories about people hiding their wealth in the ground and burying it so they could relate to that. And there are also sometimes boxes that they'd put their wealth in and hide it, maybe coins hidden somewhere in their home. So wealthy landowners, those who did have material stuff, they often held, held title deeds for landed ownership. And we're going to also be looking over this series about ownership, who really owns all that we have. But for these title deeds, these people were hearing, oh, yeah, that's right, wealthy landowners, they had both land and everything in it. And then there's someone in this illustration that Jesus is saying, oh, my gosh, this guy found hidden treasure. But not only did he find hidden treasure, the way that these people were hearing that story, because they would have thought that the end of that story is that man is now so wealthy, that man now is going away with full resources but Jesus is saying, there's another emphasis that I want to make. And this is the emphasis that we need to hear from. Upon the great wealth of the kingdom is what we are to invest and buy and pay the price of. And the price that we must be willing to pay for is for the kingdom value, not for wealth in material ways. And so he challenges their worldviews. He's emphasizing there that the great worth of the kingdom and the price you must pay to be able to step into that has come by following the way that he did that. And so we're going to look at things that are valuable to him and we're going to look also at our stuff that are valuable to us and to him. And today I just wanted to pick up on a a story that has been part of our journey as a church 
And I just want to have the big idea today as being this. We cannot be a missional, sending, healthy, growing, receiving, welcoming church unless we are prepared to pay the price for it. We can't be that church unless we are prepared to pay for the worth and treasure of the kingdom amongst us. And when this church started in 1996, many of you probably know the story, and if you're visiting, I'm sorry if this sounds like family story time, like a slideshow, <laughs> but I hope that you'll be able to resonate as well. But when this church started, Yarra Valley Vineyard, there was no Bill Gates. There was no big pot of money waiting for this church to start. It was through the generosity and the kingdom generosity of the spirit of the people that welcomed that church, welcomed the founders, welcomed the team, and welcomed the community to start something that was God's idea. And that's the way we want to continue as his kingdom church, as his kingdom people, and recognizing that we're only here through the generosity of God and others responding to his generosity. And we can't be a missional, sending, healthy, growing church with all the healing offered to others unless we're prepared to pay the price for it. I didn't know about Harry's dream, but this is the message that God put on my heart. Can you see the similarities of what he's saying? He's speaking prophetically and he's also saying, are we willing, again, to pay the price for that? So I'm going to tell you about two ordinary school teachers who we know and love. And if you haven't met them, their names are Ron and Anne Matheson. If you haven't met them, they just were ordinary school teachers for many, many years. But two weeks ago, they celebrated a kingdom venture that represented what value of the kingdom looks like. And so I'm just going to lead you through that story because we had a part of that and we can continue to celebrate what God's doing and be invited into more. So Ron and Anne, two weeks ago, if you're on our Facebook group, community group, you have seen that there's a video, a YouTube of all that happened two weeks ago. So if you haven't seen it, it's worth going back and having a look. <laughs> there's lots of African dancing because they are in Uganda. And part of their call was to go to Uganda and to build a school. So they arrived and the first thing that, we well, you know the story is the first thing they did was purchase land. It looked like a jungle. And now, 10 years later, it's a school <laughs> with buildings, with a complex for a church, with teachers employed. 10 years later, there's also a teacher's college that they also developed. And they decided with their kingdom view that there was going to be a moment of celebration where they would hand on that whole thing as a gift to Ugandans that live there to carry that through. So 10 years ago, there was nothing except something in their heart and God's vision that started to grow. And through that 10 years, many of you have been a big part of this. God established a kingdom venture that now has been handed over to Worship Harvest Uganda. It's the biggest gift they have ever received because they received a whole entity, a finished school with teachers, with a teacher's college and a church, gifted to them. Mind-blowing. And what a celebration. And all of you have had opportunity to be a part of that. Some of you have been there, some of you invested in it, and some of you continue to do that with your life story. All along they had the future generosity that this was something that was going to be a benefit for someone else. This was going to be something that they would then step away and hand over. That was always the plan. It wasn't about them ho hosting for the rest of their life this amazing thing. They planned with God that someone else would take this further. Humility in kingdom generosity. So in receiving this biggest gift, there were 1,200 people, mostly black faces except for Ron and Anne's daughter and her family from Melbourne that happened to be there as well. It's amazing. You've got to see the video. And they stood to tell the story of God's goodness. And this is how they were called. 
And in the celebration, 1,200 people, plus everyone watching on YouTube, in that moment, there was just a joy that reaches way beyond earth, <laughs> that there was something now established through the calling of two ordinary school teachers from Australia. Now, here's the thing with kingdom generosity. Being called by God comes at a cost, and often that cost is felt before you see the benefits of the new direction. And so for us as a church, those of us that have been around for a long time, <coughs> Ron started as part of his staff role. He started to step out of that role and take big trips to Africa 10 years ago. And so what happened was that this, this church had to show kingdom generosity towards this new thing that was happening with Ron. And so immediately, in the same way that he was responding to God's call and he was responding to paying the price to go to Africa, in direct correlation, we as a generous kingdom community had to also trust that as Ron stepped out, God would fill the gaps here. That's not easy for those of us that stay in a place while others go and do kingdom ventures. But your faithfulness, this church's faithfulness, was recognising someone was saying yes to God's call and it came at a cost and we didn't feel the benefits of that new direction until we started to see things established because they were exploring that. That's the way that God often works. He puts something in our hearts that's way too big for us to carry and then he puts people around to help that vision come to pass. And so today, as part of our stepping into kingdom generosity, I wanted to publicly say thank you to this church, to you individuals who have walked through many transitions. We've walked through many people leaving to other kingdom ventures or just leaving. And we have had a kingdom generosity that is needed to be extended as we see God do new things. And many of you join in with something that God's doing, like in Africa, and others of you just bless, as, bless people as they move on. But I want to thank you for having a kingdom generous heart. And we're seeing it on the ground. We're seeing it here. Trev, last week, if you weren't here, thanked this church for the way that support just was wrapped around his family as they welcomed the two new twins. And this is all part of our kingdom generosity. You guys are really good at it. Sneaky little things being done without, and I get the privilege as a pastor to hear from the receivers that there's so much generosity flowing through the people of this church. So thank you. We are not doing this series because we're not doing well. We're doing this series because God's increasing our faith and opportunity to continue to see this work here through this church and through your lives move forward into a time of great joy. We can't be a missional sending church unless we're prepared to pay the price for it. So Ron and Anne, we saw that and we saw that um, for Anne, as she's telling the story, her call started very young. So Ron started 10 years ago to go to Africa with just annual trips to help with building things. Anne and her parents were already on a mission uh, mindset. And when she was very young, God spoke to her about going to Africa. <laughs> and so your call can start at the very beginning of your life, where you land where you are born and I want to say that for me I was born in um, living a lot of my life in Mildura which was right on the state corner so we've got Victoria swim across the river and we are in New South Wales another two hours that way we're in South Australia so for me <coughs> with the thing that God's called me to do <laughs> I didn't see state borders in the same way as everyone else saw state borders. For me, it wasn't a, a thing that was a barrier. It was something that you just crossed and you were in another state. So for me, as a teenager, when I was choosing where I wanted to go to university, I had the options of South Australia, New South Wales or Victoria. 
Whereas a lot of people, if you're just born in one state and locked in one city, you won't have the freedom to actually explore other options. And so for me and for you, God knows that your birthplace is really important. And so if you are in this locality right now, it's probably for a reason. It's probably because there is a work that God's wanting to do in this chapter of your life. And he knows that calls can start very early. And so part of our spiritual um, direction and part of our spiritual asking God what's our next chapter, ask him about your birthplace, whether that has anything to inform you in the way that you're living out your life. Because I didn't experience Victoria as my only home. Ron and Anne didn't experience um, Victoria, Melbourne, as their only home. I wonder what that's like for you. Have you also got a wide view or is God saying, no, it's just here? Part of kingdom generosity and where you direct it, it's going to be really important that you know, what's he calling you to, to invest in? When I, so when I um, did end up going to Teachers College, I chose Melbourne because I wanted to have an experience of what it was like to be in city living. And then I got sent to the far remote place, Koryong. Remember I've talked about Koryong? So Mildura, one end of Victoria, and then Koryong, the other end. But it wasn't a challenge to me. It was like I was born for that. I was born for living remote or in the country. It didn't challenge my mindset because God had already trained my way of relating to the world as being where he needed me to be. And so if you think about my story, I just want to share a few little points so you understand where I'm coming from with the spirit of generosity that we're going to be looking at. And I tell you, that I've just, um, just again, being rem- remembering and also had a refreshing time of just seeing how God is wanting to reveal how much he wants his nature to be known as a generous father. Just aware that we are probably going to finish up in a moment, so I'm just just listening to the Lord about what I need to say next. Today, the Lord's pressing on our hearts that there is going to be an invitation for us to be a church that's willing to pay the price. And so as we step into this series of kingdom generosity, first, here, announced loud, you are a generous people. I see it, I know it, I believe it. And he's also going to anchor us in his generosity and ask us to stretch towards something that's going to involve risk, that will involve cost. And he's asking us again, are you up for it? With that picture, are you up for that? That you will pay the price to be ready to be a healing church. And that is much more than just saying yes. Last week, I was sitting over here, Rob was sitting over here, Rob that was up here earlier, and there was something that was in him that he saw no one else was standing up but I'm going to it's that kind of spirit that the Lord is going to put in us that others might just sit back and go yep Rob said nah I'm stepping into that I'm taking this and it was hard wasn't it Rob and you had made some decisions and would I do this and if I do this it's going to be this and he's looking for those things to happen that God's going to meet him in that and for us we will see the spirit animate us towards something and that means that he's going to give you clarity as to what to step into and what to come alongside and also what to receive and so set free is one of those things that's going to help our hearts be ready for what he's calling us into but there will also be other things as well as we journey through this series. <clears throat> With Ron and Anne, each step that they took towards their calling, like us, God entrusted more. So first of all, buy one block, block of land. Build something on that. 
and then they needed more provision, and then they needed more help, and then they needed teachers, and then they needed to train teachers, and then they needed to find someone who they could hand that on to, that, that God would entrust that whole school, teachers' college and church to them. And so our journey as a church has always been like that, that we are called to be entrusted with something and then we take another step further and he gives us more resources for that. And then we take another step and we see that as well. And I'm just giving you the headline that that is going to happen for us again. It's going to happen again. And just like for my own personal journey where I lived in a place where barriers of border was not a problem for me, went to a college, went remote, then came back to a place where I could study because something with the call of God on my life changed while I was an ordinary teacher, teaching in a classroom. My vision for a work that God wanted to do grew. And I knew I needed to then respond to that. And the cost was that I had worked full-time, plus I did full-time study within a year, and I simplified my life so that I would save and save and save so that I could take a year off from teaching and go and do what was on my heart to pre be prepared for what was coming. And that I didn't know. I had no idea what was coming, but I knew I had to save, I had to study, and then I had to take a year off. No income for a year. Came back after that training for a year of doing cultural mission and also learning about worship. And then God said, would you do that and actually do that locally? So what I was doing overseas, would you actually do that locally in Bendigo, Victoria? And so for a year, I took another year off trusting that God was my provider and I had to learn what that felt like. Two years in a row, no income, learning dependence. Then I got a third opportunity at the end of that year and I was so excited because I thought, yay, back into the workforce in a way that felt more normal for me because I felt like I could control income if I was working. And so what happened, my journey was a little different because then a new church was starting in Lilydale, and they were going to have a worship pastor that looked like me. And there was no church at that time, there were people that were ready to welcome a new church, a new church that was God's idea. And I had had two years of learning how to depend on God. I was ready to step into teaching. I could do both, teach and do something with the new church. And I consulted with Jesus. And he said, another year, please. Will you trust me? That was so hard. This is what... My heart is coming from that foundation of he is generous. He puts generous people around us to express who he is. And he will sustain you whether you're in extreme hardship or whether you're in a very difficult time. He sustains us. And not only does he sustain us, he wants to be generous towards us. But I wrestled with the question of, would you come and be a worship pastor here? Didn't know what a worship pastor was at that point. <laughs> would you come and be in a new location, someone that's going to help with the work of God <laughs> to raise up a new church? There were other people that were here ready. I could have said no and it would have been fine. I could have gone back to teaching, but my call had become bigger in my heart and I wanted to be a, in a part of a kingdom generosity and where that flow and anointing, as Harry would say, is growing amongst a people. And so I needed, in that wrestle, I needed to know for sure that that was going to be somewhere he would provide for me because it felt a big risk. Not only was I coming to a generous community, but I was also saying, God, a third year? <laughs> really? I'm very responsible. It felt like that was not going to be a responsible choice. And during that wrestle, I had a letter in the mail that came. And it was from a lawyer in Muralbark. I was living in Bendigo. So the very location next to where we're thinking about this new venture, a letter came. And it said, Die Hocking, 
there's some unclaimed money for you. Come and pick it up in Murobak. <laughs> of all the places in Victoria, the location where he had a good idea, let's start a new venture, you be a part of it, and I will provide in that location. It was great. I said, God, did you make up money for me? Did you create money for me? He was speaking a language that just stopped any anxiety for me about him providing. I always go back to that. When things look tight, when there's anxiety in my heart, he promised he would provide in this location to me and to us. So I'm coming with this series with confidence, not scarcity, I'm coming with full confidence in a generous God that's about to lead us into another chapter. And I want to stand here and invite you in that and say, will you pay the price with us again as we move through this? Will we learn together again that it's, it's his idea that this work is going to have people coming through doors and find healing? It's his idea. And then we pay the price by saying, can I volunteer and be a part of that as well? Can I step into that? A kingdom generosity that's going to flow through us to others that will benefit. A kingdom generosity that will be, we are here and called to stay and we are here and called to see his work again through us. And we are called and saying yes to the people that need to know his generosity. So that's the journey that we're about on. We're not going to look to Bill Gates in big pockets. We, well, gosh, some of you might have big prayers like that. But we are expecting that God's going to reveal his nature as generous again. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore we're surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses that we throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For the joy set before him. One of the big things I learned in a kingdom generous people and through a community of people was I was not very good at receiving. And so there was not a lot of joy when people wanted to be generous towards me because I didn't like feeling that I was owed anything. It's a hard lesson, isn't it? Some of us are not good at receiving. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, he's saying that the joy set before him was the motivation. I noticed in this community, as people were teaching me how to receive, because I wasn't very good at it, they would say this phrase, don't rob me of my joy. Don't rob me of the joy of giving. That's a seed I want to plant in us, that the joy set before him, what he walked through so much in giving his life, and yet he knew that there was a joy awaiting on the other side. And that's the heart of a kingdom generosity that we are walking with. Don't let his joy be robbed. Don't let anyone's joy be robbed, being givers and receivers before us to see people find him. Would you like to stand? If you can, it would be great. Just We're going to just finish with presenting ourselves again before him. Thank you, Lord, that you've already been ministering to us. Thank you that you're putting in front of us an invitation. And thank you, Lord, that in our hearts it's not always easy to say yes when there's a cost. And so right now we just fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Each of us, we've put our eyes and our attention to you. And we say we want to experience the joy again <laughs> the joy of being receivers of all that you've given us father you just a burden towards generosity 
rather than a joy, would you ta start to lift that off our hearts? Start to lift that off our experience. Start to break in with sudden moments towards us. Would you put in us again the ability to ask for what we need? That we would then wrestle through, I'm not seeing it, I'm not seeing it. <gasps> there it is, Lord. Would you again just create in us a longing and a willing heart that would say, I'll sign up again, Lord. I want to see your joy. I want to feel that again. I want to be part of what you're doing. So, Lord, if there's anything, any points of pain that you want to deal with, would you create those spaces for us to be able to see you break through with healing, with joy, and with generosity? And, Lord, I even ask for abundant joy to be part of our story. I ask that that abundant joy would be returned to us, that you'd restore all joy to us. And Lord, I now just release your blessing on this kingdom generous community. Those that have given out of pain, those who have given out of maybe not feeling like they have much, but those who have also given out of abundance, Lord, thank you. Would you just continue to see your goodness flow through us? We want to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen.